May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Please open your Bibles to Psalm 124. Psalm 124 has a word in it, and that word has made people laugh, had made people cry. It has uh, strengthened families, and it has torn families apart. It has been the word used in the rise of governments and the fall of governments, and that word is if. Starts with if and is all about if, and we'll talk about what it says about if. But first we're going to talk about if. Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem, very famous, entitled If. It is in your bulletin. It is not scripture, but it is very insightful. If you want to have a successful life, you follow Christ and take the advice of Rudyard Kipling. If is a conditional sort of word. It is a word that if we say, well, if this happens, then that will happen. If, uh, you know, for example, my investments, for example, triple. I can say, if my investments triple, then I'll be okay financially. And I can think about that. I can use if to mourn the past. I can say, if only something happened in the past, then my life would be different, and I can be sad about that. I can use it to plan the present. I can say to my wife, if we go to Santa Cruz, then we can have a relaxing time, for example. We can use it to dream about the future, is that if I do certain things, if I buy a new car today, I will have a car that will last for quite some time, these types of statements. The difficulty is people will use it to blame people. People will use it to blame God. I have heard people say who do not go to church anymore, they were raised in church, and one person in particular said, if this relative had not died, if God had not allowed this relative to die, if God had not, they're saying in their mind, killed this relative, then my life would be happy-go-lucky, and they are putting on the past, saying that if the past was changed, my present would be much better. And because it is something like a financial crisis, a health crisis, a death in the family, it is very easy to put the if on God and say, if only God had acted a different way, if only God had done what I wanted him to do, then my life would be better, would be happy-go-lucky, that sort of idea. And that sort of idea is dangerous because what is happening is the clay is talking to the potter saying, be different, and we don't have this sort of authority. God has a sovereignty that is inconceivable by human standards, nobody, nothing, not even history, not even Baal, not even Dagon of the Philistines, nobody, spiritual or physical on this earth, can successfully stand against God and change his direction. He's going to do what he's going to do, and so I cannot throw past conditional things to blame God. But this starts by saying, if it had not been for the Lord, and this is a good way to look at the if statements concerning God. I can look at my past. And whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or 15 years or 5 years or 5 minutes, God has been working in your life even before you were saved. That is clear in Scripture that God does not just notice you after you become saved. And so we can actually look, and some people do journaling, some people talk with people. I can look, you know, 25 years ago, and I'll say, well, if I wasn't with God, if God wasn't with me, if he wasn't on my side, if I wasn't on his side, if God was not in my life, I can speculate how it would have turned out. And you can, what you're doing is speculating how you would live as a non-Christian. And that is a interesting way to look at life because if you honestly believe you would have been involved in crime or married a different person or 
been a party animal and therefore, you know, died young or whatever. These sorts of things are what God has saved you from. When I say God has saved me, we can always ask the question, what has he saved me from? And the, the quick answer is, well, he saved me from hell, which is true. I'm spending time in heaven in eternity. I'm not spending time in hell. I'm saved from that. But he also saved me from a life without him, a life where I am fully and completely on the throne, a life full of selfish ambition, a life that is anti-God. And I can, you know, think about that. I can dream and I can actually look at how the world is. I, I do know people who have turned away from the church after they graduated from high school and I see how their life has gone in a different direction while my life and your life has not. You know, you're still involved with God and God is still having input in your life and you still believe that prayer has value and these sorts of things. And if God was not in your life, you wouldn't think these sorts of things. And so we do that not to think that the unchristian life is more fun. We do that because God has saved us from that, because the life without Christ is a purposeless life. The life without Christ is a meaningless life. There is no meaning in politics, and there is no meaning in governmental systems, and there is no meaning in conflict or peace. There is no meaning in any of these things that the world will promote and preach, because it all ends. It all will end. We talk about this sort of government system we like and this one we don't and this person we like and this person we don't. Give it 50 years. They're all going to be dead. Okay? And so it, uh, another thing will happen. Not so with Christ. If Christ is in my life today, he will be in my life 50 years from now, whether I am here or whether I am there. And so we can ask these questions of what sort of things would I be doing, what sort of things would I be like, and believe that God has saved us from that. Another way of looking at the Psalms and commentators and your scholastic types always want to know, well, when was it written? It says, David wrote it, and can we find a place in 2 Samuel, where David was doing his king things, 1 Samuel, when he was doing his shepherd things, can we find a light time in David's life where it makes sense when he would have written this? And there are a variety of thoughts. The general consensus is the story in 2 Samuel 5. 2 Samuel 5, Saul is still king. David is in line to be king. And the Philistines do this fantastic, huge frontal attack trying to wipe out Israel. All of the cities and kingdoms of the Philistines all came together and there were hundreds of thousands, perhaps a million Philistines. They wanted to wipe out the Jews once and for all. They were a thorn in their side from the Philistines' point of view. From the Jewish point of view, the Philistines were the thorn in the side. But from the Philistines' point of view, they wanted to wipe out the Jewish people, take the land, its great arid farmland, and so they would have moved in and expanded their kingdom. And they do this frontal assault against Saul. Saul is seeming to be weak at this point. He is ending. God has already condemned him for going against God's will. In other words, Saul rejected God, and God, Saul was now living without God. And you can read the story and go, aha, well, there's a story of somebody who was living with God and who's no longer living with God and how it turned out. Well, the Philistines killed him and killed his sons, killed all of his sons, but killed especially Jonathan, who was a star in 1 Samuel as being a best friend of David. And so... David being able to watch this, if the Philistines were successful, David is not the commander of the military, but if they wipe out Israel before the kingdom split, if they wipe out Shiloh and all the cities that were uh, put together in Joshua, if they wipe all that out, David would also be killed. The Jewish people would be destroyed, and God's 
promise of an eternal throne for David would have been thrown away. God would have been proven to be a liar. And so David, looking at this, he, it is believed that he was overwhelmed. Is God really on our side? Perhaps he thought. He kind of answers it here. Is God really going to keep his promises? Once again, he, pro he answers that here. And he gives some fantastic imagery about the Philistine army coming into Israel. And reading this, it's possible for us to say, oh yeah, that's happened to me. Or, oh yeah, I had a situation where it was just like that. And that's why you have the poetry and the imagery of the Psalms, because they are universal. They speak to each person in a different way. And so let's look at this. It says, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, proclaim this. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, the Philistines, they would have swallowed us up alive. And when I read this, I remembered the poster of a bird that has a frog in his mouth, and the frog is half swallowed, but the frog has his hands around the bird's neck. And it's the idea that if the enemy is big enough, it is like an animal just swallowing the prey whole. There are animals who, when they come across a smaller animal, won't even chew it. They'll just swallow it whole and let the digestion do their work. And that was the image that David had when you saw the Philistines come, that they were like a huge lion eating a, you know, small gopher or a small, you know, jackrabbit or something. It's just the lion comes and no more jackrabbit. The idea of swallowing it whole. Then it says a flood submerging its victims in verse 4. The flood would have swept us away. The people in the time of David, the people in the time of Jesus, for example, people who lived 2,000 years ago, and I'm not really sure when this changed, actually believed in a worldwide flood in Genesis, believed that God in his wrath flooded the whole world and only saved Noah and his family in a boat called an ark. The... If you asked a Jewish person 3,000 years ago, describe destruction to me, describe what the Philistine army is like, they would say, well, it's like God's wrath in the flood back in Genesis because that was understood to be real, that was understood to be something that actually happened. Uh, it says in Second Peter that people at the end times, which we're in apparently, uh, will deny the flood, and today it is denied. Today, the average person, I have met people who are Bible-believing, church-going Christians who believe the flood is a fairy tale, okay? We have to believe it for one reason and one reason only. It is an example of God's wrath, and if we believe God doesn't have that level of wrath to wipe everybody out, then we weaken God. And so we must believe in every word of the Bible, every story of the Bible, including the story of the flood. And so that is how they see it. That's the imagery that is used. And that, is, that imagery is actually used, I think, 16 times in the Old Testament where an invading army or a plague is called a flood because that is how the Jewish mind puts it together with a biblical story. As the flood wiped everybody out, the Philistines are going to wipe everybody out. It says, a torrent rushing over everything. Once again, more water. It says, a raging, uh, let's see, over us would have gone the raging waters. It is like the, the flood. And there are, there are fanciful if you will, movies about ancient Rome and with computer simulation, you just see, you know, a billion of these little soldiers, you know, marching on Troy and it's just a sea and you just have so many people there that the ground is covered. You can't even see the ground and that's how you were guaranteed to win an ancient battle is that you had to have 
a lot of babies in your country and you got to raise them up to be soldiers. You got to have a lot of boy babies and that's why kings had 20 or 30 wives because you wanted to have lots of strong soldiers and the king felt that their, their line would be strong. And the, the idea that you, you look out over the hills and there's so many Philistines that you can't even see the ground. And I think one modern example of this is fires and fire season. Had it last year, have it again this year, that it's coming like a wave. It is coming and it will bowl you over. And there's nothing that can stop it. There is nothing that can stop the enemy of the fire just moving across the land. And that's how ancient armies were. And that's what we have today. Now, we can't... The fire is not sinful. Some people say, well, it's an attack of Satan. Well, maybe, I don't know, God invents fire, you know. God's behind all these sorts of things, I think. I think the way that, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. You can say, well, this, this, and this would have prevented it. Or this, this, and this would have stopped it. Eh, maybe, who knows. But there are, seems to be an annual event now where there are great fires through the unburnt parts, and I think once California burns to the ground, as it were, we won't have any fires anymore, but it's that sort of wave that just comes over and bowls you over. There is no defense, and that is what David saw with the Philistines, and we can look at anything in our life and go, oh yeah, well I had this big problem, a medical problem years ago that just bowled me over, no defense, that I had this financial difficulty some time ago. It just rolled right over me, no defense. I just had to, you know, just sit there and look at it as, uh, you know, my checking account balance goes negative or whatever it was that happened. The events in our lives, some of them we are absolutely powerless against. They will just happen. And they will bowl us over. And the question you have to ask is, well, is God on your side? Is the Lord with you in this? Somebody has asked the question uh, in probably book form some time ago of why does God let us go through difficult times? Why does God allow suffering in the life of a Christian? And the short answer and one of about six answers is that God is with you in the suffering, that God is carrying you through the suffering, and this is, an example of it is the footprints poem, where God and me are walking along, and I can look down and see two footprints, and then I go, oh wait, there's only one, God has left me, the poem says, but God says, no, I'm carrying you, it's God's footprints, that God is with us, God does not throw you into a difficulty and then run around to the other side and say, come to me. God is in with you, and there is some aspect, probably primarily this aspect of sanctification, that apparently, and Jesus said this, apparently suffering makes us more Christ-like. I want to, somebody says, who wants to be Christ-like? We raise our hand, I want to be Christ-like. And the answer to how you get that way, apparently, from Scripture and experience, is some pain, is some suffering, is a little bit of trauma, is a catastrophe here and there. That God bringing us through that, we are, even though we don't like it, we are more Christ-like at the end. Now, when it's really at the end, we will understand that this whole life has been nothing but a life of suffering. There's been some happy times here and there, but compared to heaven, this life is nothing but garbage and suffering, and God will be there. When we get there and the angels take us up to his presence, we will be there, we will be glorified, and we'll go, wow, that was a rough ride, but hey, look, I'm in the presence of God, and then we will be able to honestly say, if God had not been with me in my life, it would have been terrible. I would have fallen for all sorts of stuff. I would have done my own thing and died early and all this kind of stuff. And we will have a better and clearer understanding 
of that if statement when we are in the presence of God. The last two things are an animal grinding his prey. Uh, This is how an animal, uh, 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 a lion, for example, eats a gazelle. And then when it's all done, the lion just grinds on the bones for days and days and days and days and days. And sometimes life's like that, you know. It's like I want my trauma to be short. But sometimes it just grinds on and on and on. And you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. But God is the light at the end of the tunnel. He's also in the tunnel with you. And that's what we have to understand. We have to begin saying, God is with me. And if God is with me, what does it mean? And then last, a bird entailed in a trap. Uh, Back in those days, they would catch birds in nets and stuff. And then they would be sacrifices or they would eat them. We get our birds at the grocery store today, but we don't go out and catch our own. But if you were a bird hunter who hunted birds for food, you would catch them and not allow them to escape. And this psalm is saying that's kind of how we are sometimes, just totally trapped. And the end is not good, is what we believe. And so we need to trust in God once again. If you look at the last verse, it says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And there's three ways to look at this. We could say, our help is in the name of the Lord. The Lord, who's omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent, the creator of everything. The Lord who, I can't help him, but he can sure help me. Lord, the Lord who can do anything. The Lord who is sovereign over everything. That is our help is that we need to have a proper view of God, that when we ask tough stuff, we know that He can do it. We know that He will do it in His way and His time. The second thing, our help is in the Lord. It's honest and good and true help. God isn't, well, I'm just going to roll the dice and see what happens. No, God is very involved in our lives, very involved in your life, very involved in my life that when I'm stuck and I pray for help, help will come and he can do it. I cannot ask anything that is too hard for God. He will fill it in his time and his way, but he is with you every step of the way. And then the last one is our help is in the Lord. It isn't our as a national thing, I can't say, well, God's going to help Israel, and that's it. No, our is an individual. It is our together, our individual, that we are, I can individually ask. I don't have to ask you or call a priest or call my executive minister or call anybody. I can ask the creator of the universe for real, honest-to-goodness help. And what will happen is he will help. Now, if I have some twisted view of me being on the throne and I think help is a million dollars, he may not. He may, but he may not give us a million dollars. He just may show you how to live with your current income. He may give you wisdom. Sometimes the only help we will get is wisdom and understanding of our current situation. You think, well, that's not fair, but that's you being on the throne. That's the clay telling the potter how to answer your prayers. God is going to answer your prayers his way. And you can individually, in the quiet, in the busy, while you're standing in line, you can pray for help to the God of the universe, to the God who is above all. That is who we pray to And that is who will watch over us. God is with us in Christ. God is with us in everything we do. And God is with us in death. And when we close our eyes here, we are in heaven. For for Christians, and I say this at every funeral, for Christians, death is merely a change of location. That is all. We are the same. We are glorified. You will still be who you are. You will be able to recognize each other 
with a little bit of prompting perhaps. I don't know, Mary had a little problem with Jesus. But we will be who we are. Our personalities will still be the same. The things that make us us will still be the same. And today we can ask for help. God will help. And in eternity, we won't need help because we'll be in the presence of God Almighty and all will go great because there will be no trauma, there will be no sin, there will be no pain, and there will be no death. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you as the creator of the universe. You bring us to a place where we can worship you, where we can praise you, where we can stand in your glory, not my glory, but your glory. And Lord, we praise you for that and ask your blessing upon the remainder of the day. We ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen.